Well, this is going to be a real fun discussion. We uh, last talked uh, several years ago, probably four year ago, three or four years ago. I don't know exactly, but uh, we have with us the the host of the Symbolic World Channel, Jonathan Pajot. How you doing, Jonathan? It's um, doing great. It's good to see you. I'm really I'm really happy to see your channel growing and you getting these amazing conversations. I've kind of been following you from afar and listening to a few of them, like Zizek and things like that, which I yeah. thought it was just great that you were able to get him. Yeah, that was fun. I said, I said, I, I sent him an email. I said, I want to do a discussion about Holy Spirit community in time of pandemic. I wrote it just like that. And he just said, let's do it. You know, <laughs> then it went off into some kind of thing. He took it, but it was fun, you know, but uh, I, you really have been uh, talking more and more about a subject that I've kind of used as a, as a guiding toolkit for this podcast, uh, Things Hidden. Uh, which is the work of mimetic theory, Rene Girard, the work that he developed. I, I saw you had a great discussion with uh, my friend Craig Stewart, who, who did a great job getting into it with you. Um, and you've kind of taken it and integrated it into some of the other things that you have been analyzing about uh, culture and art and so forth uh, in your uh, you know videos that you put, on, put out. So I thought, hey, this is a great time to circle back with you and, 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 and kind of uh, get into some of the latest application of these uh, insights that that you and I have been kind of swimming in. The story that interests me is this American uh, conservative.com. Rod Dreher put out a story about you. He says, Pajo breaks down Little Nas X satanic video. And so you, I'd seen that you had had some issues with getting the video out. And I don't know what that was all about, but you, but he asked you for the transcript and you went ahead and sent it to him, right? Yeah, well, I, the videos that I made were improvised. And so Rod wrote me and he said, I'd really like to publish the transcript for those videos if you have it. Have it. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to just, I am going to write it. So I just actually spent a few days writing it up and then uh, sent it, sent it to him to publish. So, Yeah, it was very good. And, uh, you know, I just want to use it as kind of a launching point to dive into the issues that you uh, touched on in that uh, article that Dreyer published that you wrote. Uh, there's something that I saw in here that 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 really stood out for me, and um, it's this idea uh, that you say if in traditional societies we see scapegoat mechanisms sacrificing the exception in order to preserve coherence, here it is a desire to sacrifice the entire world for the exception. That's very Girardian. Very good stuff. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Well, I think that Girard's ideas have slowly. I, you know, at first I just wondered what this was about. You know, I didn't really understand it. Then I started to understand what it is that he was talking about. And then I also saw that later, especially towards the end, you know, in, in more recent decades, he was really perceiving this kind of upside down scapegoat mechanism, which is happening and which is accelerating. And, and when I started to see that, I thought, wow, he really put the finger on the situation and is also able to explain what's happening in a, in a very simple manner. And that people, because people are confused, they're looking around and they're thinking, what is happening, right? Anybody who has some kind of sense is thinking, why, is, why are all these strange values coming to the fore? Why are all these strange upside down hierarchies appearing to us? And I think that Girard's model definitely gives us a, a, a good end on understanding why this is happening. And the, this pattern of antichrist as being as being kind of the main pattern that that is that is going on. I think there are other ways to understand it as well, but his definitely is a is a very good one. And the, the word antichrist, I've heard it explained recently uh, from a, a Christian priest that actually it means the, uh, it's not nece necessarily opposite of Christ, but rather another Christ. That's really the word there. Is that what you've seen too, or how do you interpret that term, antichrist? What is it? Well, mean? I kind of understand it as. The way that I understand it, it's almost like it's part of the Christian story. It's like it's it's coming to the, you could call it like the end of the Christian story, where there can, really can be there can't be an other Christ really, and so it's like a parody. It's like an it's like a a, a bad copy, but also like an upside down version. One of the things that I talk about is that the normal model of a world will have at the edge of its world an upside down. You know, and it's that just an, it's like an inevitable aspect of reality, which is any identity has a certain coherence. And the last aspect of that coherence is like its opposite. 
because its opposite participates in its existence, right? It participates in defining what it is. And so on the edge of the Greek world, you had Amazons where there was like an upside down world with women in charge and women warriors, and which was showing them a kind of upside down to their identity. And, but what it does, it also consolidates your identity. So in traditional worlds, you had carnivals on the edge of the town where you would have freak shows and you'd have people doing upside down things and, and turning and, and flipping up in the air and, and, and doing all these uh, kind of turning things. Um, so the same thing with like the idea of um, a carnival uh, feast. So like Purim, for example, at the end of the Jewish year or at the end of the medieval Christian year, you'd have the Feast of Fools or you'd have even the Feast of the Ass which was like this donkey feast where they would bring the donkey up to the altar. So you'd have these upside down, uh, these upside down celebrations that show you the upside down so that, so then you can understand what normal, nor, normalcy is. Um, right. And one of my contentions has been that we're in a carnival world. Like right. our whole, all of Western history is basically entering into a carnival space. And that reminds me of the Saturnalia festival, you know, the yep. Romans did where they would choose someone to represent a king, a mock king. And, uh, um, you know, the Christian writers said that there was actually some human sacrifice at the origins of the Saturnalia festival. Uh, of course, the more contemporary historians like, oh, no, of course not. It was just animals. You know, they're very sophisticated people. They don't, would never do him, human sacrifice. It. <laughs> you, you, you look at it and it looks like, you know, you're, you're offering up a, uh, uh, you would take a young man and and adorn him in, in kingly attire and then, you know, parade him around and sacrifice him to the God of Saturn for the blessings of the new harvest, you know, and so forth, the next seasonal pattern, because that was the darkest day of the year, right? The uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the time that they would celebrate, December 26th, I think, right? Is that the yeah, well, the, the, the solstice is usually around December 22nd, but it doesn't matter. It, it's like, right. it's the same, it's the same period, right. same as, as Christmas too. You know, it, it, it's a it's a solstice uh, celebration. So, and Gerard says that those, those, those carnivals and those, those festivals were uh, a, a marked out time in which you could kind of, the ancient societies would let loose. So as to demonstrate, this is what undifferentiation looks like. This is what happens when we get rid of taboos. This is what happens when we get rid of boundaries of differentiation. Yeah. Uh, if you're putting on a mask, you don't know if you're dancing with the mayor's wife or the peasant girl. If you're sharing a feast, somebody brought, uh, you know, Lunchables. The other guy brought lamb roast and they all get to eat from the same table. You know, yeah. that would cause strife if you did that every day. You know what I mean? Wait a second. You know, and then, you know, and then orgies and all these things, this intermingling of identity into this kind of undifferentiated chaos is meant for a certain time. And then they would culminate that with a sacrifice the, to remind people, okay, so you had your fun and guess what happens when we go wild, we have to sacrifice a shared, you know, collective uh, offering to appease the stirred up desires that we attribute to be gods. Right. And so um, that's, that's what you see those festivals for, but you're right. Now we live in a world in which carnival has become the normative standard. It's not a marked out time. It is the def default time, you know? Yeah. Well, you could understand it almost as if if you have carnivals at the end of small cycles, it's at the end of a, of a, of a year, then you would have also you were having we just have a massive carnival. It's like we're at the end of something big, let's say, you know, and so it feel that's what it feels like. It's like that Western society is, is reaching a point where it's it's moving in. It's got, there's going to be a massive transition coming soon. And so we've entered into like a massive carnival state. Um, and it's a scary, it's scary because like you said, that carnival doesn't, uh, doesn't end well. It, it's all fun and games until you reach the, 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 you reach the, the dregs and then you drink the bitterness. And that's what, you know, you see it in the, in the, the in the, um, the hunchback of Notre Dame, the Disney movie, they have a great, uh, like representation of that where they actually have the, the feast of the fools, which is, which is a part of the, the, the movie. And you see all this upside down behavior, you know, people with heads on their bottoms and all this kind of topsy turvy thing. And then they take Quasimodo, they elect him as the King of the day. Um, and then he's celebrated. And at the end, they tie him down to the, to like a, a, a thing. And they're like, okay, back to normalcy. Um, and people don't realize that th this is kind of an inevitable thing that's on the horizon that uh, let's say an authoritarian clapdown is the next step. And that doesn't necessarily look fun. And, and that's interesting. Yeah. But you know, when, so you think the next phase 
from Carnival that we're in now is going to be a totalitarian kind of uh, settle down, folks. We've I think so. I think it's wow. inevitable. And I think we saw a smaller cycle of that in the 20th century with Weimar Germany um, and kind of decadent 19th century uh, countries like, like the, let's say, decadent 19th century Russia. There's a decadence which comes before the clampdown. Uh, and so and so I think that this is also something which is even with COVID and stuff, it's already on the horizon. We're already seeing the glimmers of uh, of uh, of clampdowns, and so, and it's almost it's not. And I don't I don't think that people necessarily do this consciously. Um, I'm sure there are some really bad actors out there, but there's also it's almost like a natural pattern which which happens, and people at some point after the the the, the degeneracy starts to 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 fester, there's like a desire to cut it off. So right. It's interesting that you were talking about, you know, in the carnival, when it gets, when it's ending, it gets to the bitter dregs. Right. And I was thinking about that in contrast to the wedding of Cana with Jesus, right. Where it's like the best is yet to come. You know, you, you, you're supposed to bring out the boxed cheap wine at the end when everybody's already sloshed so that they don't know the difference that, yeah, we're kind of wrapping up here. We've run out of uh, the good stuff, guys. It's time to kind of roll out. If you need to fight in the parking lot, that's fine, but let's kind of move on out now. Uh, well, the, the, the story of Christ is a surprising story. And Christ, one of the mysteries of Christianity is this mystery of the end where he has the sense that within the within death, there is something that can be turned back and that can be brought back. And so it's a, it's actually quite mysterious to understand, even in the story of Revelation, when you look at how everything gets really, really bad, and then it ends with this glorious city, which comes down from heaven. And so it's like really interesting, you know, that this idea that the end, there's a, there's a reversal in the end. There's like a, you know, there's a comedic move at the end where the tragedy turns into, right. into positive. Do you see? Yeah. That's what I was kind of going with that is that, you know, comedies are with, they have weddings at the end. Right. Yep. And so you see a wedding, the first miracle he does is this wedding and it's like the best is yet to come, which means that history is going to move somewhere. Now it's not going to be this eternal uh, cycle where everything's are kind everything's kind of downhill from there from the beginning, uh, but but that's what's going on there with 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 that that picture of 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 the end of of time where where heaven and earth is coming together right and it's this mm-hmm. it's this marriage of of uh, of moving beyond the same cycle of violence and tit for tat aggression right yeah and in terms of a comedy it's a perfect image because the the Shakespearean comedy. Uh, mostly it has this confusion like yeah, at the at the outset and so the development of the story is actually has a lot of gender confusion and all the stuff that we kind of see in culture today all this confusion and people like to to uh talk about that you know like this right now in times of criti- like these kind of critical theorist types they like to talk about this gender confusion and all this confusion that's in Shakespeare's story but they don't realize that it ends with a wedding that's how it ends because that's the idea is that after this confusion, there has to be something which actually reunites heaven and earth, reunites, you know, the identities with the potential. All of this has to come together, uh, you know, or else or else it's dissolution or or else it would just be it would just be death. Right? It would just be this decomposition of, of society. Do you believe that the passion is a satire on the pagan, you know, uh, sacrificial mechanisms of the past? You mean the the passion of Christ? Yes. Um, no, I don't really see it that way. The way that I see the, the thing about the cross is that it it really I think it just encompasses everything. Uh, and even like in terms of sacrifice, this is something that a lot of the people around what I'm doing we've been talking about in terms of Girard. And maybe you can maybe even speak into that. Is we we get a sense that there's some aspect of Girard's notion of sacrifice which is missing, like it's missing some aspect of sacrifice. Uh, because there's, there's an idea of sacrifice, which is also this idea of offering up, right. Of gathering together and offering up. And so you can understand it as, um, like multiplicity needs to come together in love and then offer itself up to something above it in order to preserve coherence. So there's like, like in, in terms of Yom Kippur, for example, there are two goats, right? There's one goat that is the scapegoat and goes out into the wilderness and that's that also will cause coherence because we get rid of everything that the idiosyncrasies. But then there's also a goat which is offered up, and then the blood it covers the 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 people, and then that brings them together. And so the two these two types of sacrifices seem to um, 
to, to, to be different, or at least to be almost like two, two extremes. And so in the cross, you see both. You see right. both the sacrifice, which is offered up, and then the sacrifice, which is also, which goes down into death, you know, like that Christ goes down into, into Hades to gather up the people, but he also goes into the Holy of Holies at the same time, because there's no sacrifice in the Holy of Holies. Right. Like in the altar, in, in, the, um, in the Holy of Holies, it's not a sacrificial space. And that's super important, right? Um, whereas in Christianity, we join those two together. So we have the altar inside the Holy of Holies, where we say it's like both spaces at the same time. Both is like offering up of prayer or the offering up of incense, which is not a, which is not a scapegoat sacrifice. It's like this offering up. And then at the same time, the, the, the scapegoat mechanism, which is to go out and to gather everything. So I see the passion as, as like solving all the puzzles, like solving mm -hmm. the, 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 the different puzzles of how we can exist together. Yeah, I think, um, and it's interesting when you think about that, that tabernacle sacrifice where the priest comes out and sprinkles the blood of the goat representing his blood, right? It's supposed to represent his blood as opposed to like the Aztec God where the people are going up to the God. The, in this case, the, the symbol of, of God the Father is coming out to the people to offer his own blood rather than them offering a piece of their own blood by uh, selecting a slave to be, you know, have his heart removed in front of the people at the top of the, of the, of the uh, temple, you know? So it's mm. a downward motion of, of the representative of God coming out to the people and saying, here's, here's my shed blood uh, versus uh, them trying to come up to the heavenly realm by offering uh, a token sacrifice of one of their own uh, profane, you know, peasants or whatever to appease the God. So uh, you're, you're, you're right. I do see that there's more skin in the game in this story where it's about self-sacrifice rather than sacrifice of another. And I yeah. think Ger Gerard changed his views. Uh, he modified his views a little bit about the atonement. Uh, you know, when he first, when he wrote things hidden since the foundation of the world, he was kind of negative to the book of Hebrews, right? He thought it kind of was fall. It was falling too far back into uh, a kind of pagan conception of sacrifice. But then as he got, odor and he read he thought about it more he adjusted that and said you know hebrews is actually you know it's actually fits perfectly in it's and it's perfectly uh, uh in 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 the direction of of where uh we should look at this because uh what he's saying is that you know there's there are two conceptions of sacrifice one is sacrifice of another and the other is a self-sacrifice self-emptying self, -sacrifice, self, -emptying, self mm -hmm. uh renouncing the flesh, right? And that, and that is something where it looks basically like offering mercy for people that hurt you, that you can self-sacrifice your right to, to, to reciprocate that hurt back at them. It's mm. the end of the mimetic contagion of violence. And that's what Jesus is offering. You know, he's saying, you know, so the question again still is, I mean, we don't have to go down there, but the question is, did God desire, did God demand blood for him to love humanity, or was it rather that he recognized that human beings had constructed mental models about him that had made them locked in a prison, a prison of, of needing shed blood of sacrifice. And so rather than allowing them to continue to sacrifice each other, he said, okay, I will self-sacrifice mm -hmm. to end your desire to sacrifice each other for reaching transcendence. And that includes not just the traditional sacrificial ritual, but also war, right? I mean, that's what Jesus was being tempted with on the Mount, uh, uh, Mount of Temptation. He was sitting there. I mean, I, I, was, I, I got to see, you know, I was in that Holy Land in Jericho, actually, sitting in this tell where they had excavated the original temple of sacrifice for Jericho. You know, this moon city is what it's called. And, I, and, they, and, they, and the guide said, kind of like as an aside, and oh yeah, see that mountain, that's the Mount of Temptation. And I thought about it, and I said, okay, so that's what Jesus saw probably when uh, he was being tempted by Satan to, to submit to Satan's way and inherit the world's kingdoms. He would have seen this, this massive tower in this city of Jericho, and he would have said, okay, so this is what it means to do it the worldly way. This is what it means to take power by force, and I'm being tempted to embrace that, which is ultimately the heart of the city was that sacrificial temple where they're laying human beings and sacrificing them. That's the same mentality that one would have to have 
if Jesus was to take up the sword like Barabbas wanted to do and have a revolution to overthrow mm -hmm. by force wickedness. That's a, that's a type of sacrifice, right? Yeah. No, I totally agree. I think that for sure the, the interesting aspect of, of Christianity, and, and even we can see it right away, even in the Old Testament, you have a different vision of how reality works, which is that almost all of uh, so many other pagan cultures have a revolutionary model as their as their trope. Right. And so yeah. you see it in the Greek gods, you know, how the, the son will castrate the father and then the father to stop the other from getting him will eat his children. So you have this system of revolution where there isn't a normal a normal flow of authority coming down from heaven, let's say into the world. Whereas we have a similar story in Christianity, but it's like Satan is the bad guy. Like in Greek, in the Greek mythology, Satan's not the bad guy, right? It's like the revolutionary, he's only becomes the bad guy. If, you know, once someone else comes and does a revolution against him, it's like Saturn's the bad guy because Zeus was able to, to, to get, you know, to get rid of his father. And then Satan got rid of his father. And so there's this like revolutionary process. Whereas in Christianity, we really have this idea that, you know, Christ submits to the father and he gives himself, right? He gives himself to us, to us in a certain way. He also gives himself up. You know, he, he renders his spirit up to, up to God uh, and he gives his flesh to, uh, to us to eat. And you see that, like, that really is this other sacrifice, right? The sacrifice of uh, uh, this offering up of the, the smoke to God and then giving the flesh to the people, right? That's what Christ does, takes that on himself and says, I'm going to do an ultimate version of that. I offer up to God, I give down to the people, and then you do the same, right? Now we are called to do the same, which is to, to, to offer up our spirit to God and to give our power, give our, our, our members, give our, our capacity to act in the world back to, to those around us in love. Yeah, that's true. And, and the anthropological dimension of the of the Lord's Supper is also, of course, that it's calling back our, our primordial uh, sense of the sacred, um, where you where we were doing, you know, the society, you know, you look at the history of of uh, anthropology, you look at archaeology, and it seems to me that the societies that practice ritual cannibalism were the ones that were able to outcompete those that didn't, in the sense that it was almost as if you know, this was this this kind of crutch that allowed societies to have a kind of uh, a safety valve to release their violence onto common victims and to share a sacred feast of devouring an enemy that they were scared of uh, from a rival tri rival tribe or uh, a king who had lost his touch in the throne right. and they needed to be devoured to get his essence into the society. Uh, that's that's what Jesus is calling us back to. He's it's a wake up call. He's showing us that all of our sins are actually rooted. We think we're so sophisticated, but when we take the Lord's Supper, we are hum we are humbled to remember that we're really just at the heart of the things that we do, whether it's striving for money and status and influence and popularity and all these things. It's a form of cannibalism, a spiritual cannibalism that we are striving for. So we have to direct that that direct that desire, the desire to be right. We have to redirect that back to the source of the infinite, which is yeah. what Jesus represents. And it's also the, the thing about communion is just like the cross. It it's, it's never just one thing. It's like it, it unites the opposites together. And so on the one hand, it is this scandal, like the scandal of cannibalism. Uh, but at the same time, it's also presented as a, as a, as a normal meal, like as a meal of, of communion, where we sit at a table together, where we participate in the divine life, where we come, we come together into this, this holy thing. And so it's like the holiness or the purity and the scandal are brought together into one, into one uh, space. And so yeah. there really is this, uh, I always say that Christ really does always unite all the extremes together into one, into one place. Right. And I, I wanted to also comment on what you said about revolution. It's so important and interesting because it is true that that's how pagan gods and, and so forth, they deal with that kind of cyclical pattern that, you know, you have this reigning paradigm and then it's overthrown and a revolutionary revenge. And then it goes over and over and over again. And, you know, that's what, you know, Gerard talks about. We didn't, we didn't invent our gods. We deified our victims. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting. The way Jesus approaches these, these pagan conceptions of reality is that he redeems them too. He brings them back because you, you know, uh, Jerry Boyer, a friend of mine pointed out to me once that it, it, there's a good case that, when, you know, Paul's talking about meeting um, uh, Jesus, 
And he says, you know, it is, he says, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, right? And this was a saying that was most popularly heard in the play, The Bacchae, uh, in that time. And so when Paul's recounting how, you know, he's, t- he's talking to a Greek audience and he's trying to explain to them what's so special about this Jesus that he has changed his whole life around it. And he's someone who is a, uh, you know, the, he's steeped in Jewish tradition and he's talking to these pagans trying to get them to connect what he's trying to see. He quotes this quote from the Bacchae. Mm. That would be like saying, I'll be back. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah Terminator. Okay, gotcha. I gotcha. I what you're saying. <laughs> so so he and, and and so he's so you look at that play, the Bacchae, that's Dionysus mm-hmm. speaking to King Pentheus when King Pentheus puts him on trial. And of course, Dionysus is this quintessential pagan good time deity that's about the orgies and about the wine and everything. And then he tear he's the god of the crowd. He tears, he tears his uh, victims apart in the crowd just as he was torn apart. Yeah, by the Titans. And so he's replaying the same trauma. This is important, right? This is going to get at the heart of this victimism that you've identified in this article because he's replaying the same trauma done to him. You know, Dionysus was torn apart. He had, he was a victim of child abuse, ritual child abuse by the Titans. And so he replays that trauma over and over again with his own cult that devotes themselves to him in a maddening undifferentiation of chaos so he tells King Pentheus, you think you're the king, but I'm actually the one in charge here. And it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. You can, you can run, but you can't hide. I'm, in, yeah. I'm the God here. And so when <laughs> Jesus is using the words of Dionysus or not, but Saint Paul's Paul. talking, yeah. Yeah. yeah, what he's doing is he's redeeming the victim underneath the Dionysian myth. You see, he's mm. redeeming and saying, look, this is a cycle of violence in which you can't escape but I'm here to create a new cycle of forgiveness and reconciliation so that Paul was on the road to kill more Christians. He was on the road to go tear people apart, just like Mm. Dionysus. And yet Jesus is able to speak a word uh, that, that recalls Dionysus's own mental prison and then kind of redeem it from within and say, look, you don't have to do this because it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks, meaning you can run, but you can't hide from my love and my forgiveness. Mm-hmm. It's a new order. You know, I'm not going to get revenge on you. Dionysus would get revenge on Paul for killing his followers, right? But in this new world order, Jesus is saying, no, I'm the God here, and you can't escape my forgiveness and my love. So now there's a new way that you're going to go and treat people with that same reality, you know? Mm-hmm. No, I think I think your, your insight, in, especially about how Christ includes everything in the sense that because the, I always tell people like, you, you know, you, you, everybody likes to talk about non-dualism and it's like Christianity is a non-dual religion. Uh, and what that, that means is that it actually includes everything, but it includes it in a, in this transformative way that you, that you talked about. And so it's like the, 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 the Dionysian aspect of reality, let's say is there in Christianity. It's there in, in communion itself, right? It's, it's right there in communion itself. And Christ transformed that. And so like the undifferentiation of chaos, right? Christ brings Pentecost as a, as a, as a weird surprising solution to the problem of this chaos, let's say, or this, this fragmentation or this multiplicity on the edge of us. He says, I'm going to fill that up. I'm going to fill everything up. And so the image of uh, in, in Revelation of the end, let's say, of how death itself is cast into death and how there is no ocean. And that's a crazy statement. Like it, it says there's no longer any ocean. It's like, do you know what that means? It means that everything is part of the pattern now, you know, and then there's this hierarchy and there's this like flow from the, the heavenly Jerusalem into the other nations. But there's no more. There's no more ocean. And so that undifferentiated aspect has been kind of all brought into this, ma- this, massive, uh, this, this massive participatory pattern. And so what Christ offers is like it's some of the stuff that Christ offers that we, can, we, can't, we can't fathom it yet. It's still playing out. Like it's still kind of happening. And so we don't totally have a sense of how all of this is really going to, in practice, how it's going to play out. But it, it's definitely still, all of this is still playing out. And you're saying in this, in this, the ocean is symbolic of chaos, right? Is that? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's the primordial waters. It's the tobo. It's the undifferentiated that is there from the very beginning in, uh, in scripture. And this undifferentiated aspect 
God tells Adam and Eve to, to says, you know, to fill the world, to fill the world and dominate it. And so, uh, you know, or to, to rule over it or to, you know, to, to kind of bring consciousness and intelligence all the way to the edge. And then, and then, you know, Adam and Eve fall from that and there's this massive loop, but it ends with that happening. So the idea that there's no ocean at the end of scripture is calling back to Genesis when God told Adam and Eve to fill the world. So you go out and fill the world. And so God says, yeah, it's going to happen. Even if you don't want, even if you try to get away from it, like Jonah trying to get away from God's will, it's like, even if you try to get away, it's still going to happen. There'll still be, I'll still save the city in the end, right? The end of the story of Jonah is like the end of Revelation where the city is glorified. So it's like, it's, you can't, you can't avoid it. It's happening. It's like. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I like to look at that story and it's related to the topics of your article about little Nas X and this uh, WandaVision, which we can get into a little bit, but you know, the, the, the idea of this demoniac, right. And the garrisons, you know, and he's, he's, I, I'd tell people that's the first uh, exorcism of a crowd out of a person recorded in history rather mm. than exercising, you know, a person out of the crowd. Right. Yeah. So, so that's the way the, the pagan world functions is okay. It's, we're all in this together, the new normal, the great reset minus one, you know, and that's the minus one is the person who doesn't submit to the group think in the, in the, in the, in the ritual and the, and the, and the, uh, the ideology that is commanded to them to submit mm. to you will be the fodder that binds the community together. And, and so that's what the demoniac is. He's on the outside of town. He's stoning himself. It reminds me of, of in Japan, how, uh, they have such a well-oiled machine of uh, sacrificial culture that they don't have to uh, do a lot of sacrifices. The persons, you know, they have the highest population of suicide. So it's self right. For people know? self they they kill themselves in order right. to. So it's a very well-oiled machine of sacrificial logic operating yeah. in that mecha, in that kind of society. That's what's happening with the garrison uh, demoniac. You know, he's sitting there stoning himself. He's howling into the moon. He's a great Grinch that keeps Whoville happy, right? Mm. Because he's over there and they're over there and they're not the Grinch. So every time you and I have a problem, we can always say, Hey, at least we're not that crazy guy over there. Over yeah. there, that weirdo. Laugh. Yeah. Look at that. Guy. Yeah. What a, what a psycho. You know, and <laughs> so you can always know that you're not that freak, that mm. undesirable, the untouchable, the, the deplorable, the, the Nazi, whatever he is, that's what he represents for that community. Mm. And that was supposed to be a, a model town that the Roman Empire had installed there to let the, the folks of that region know, hey, you know, this is what it looks like if you want to just go ahead and fully embrace our worldview. Look at this model city. It reminds me, of, I always think of the garrison little village like like uh, uh, Walt Disney's original version of, of what he wanted Epcot to be, you know, like this mm -hmm. is the city of tomorrow, folks, this is what you can get. So you go over there and Jesus immediately is, is dealing with the heart of what it means to have a pagan society. This crazed man he says, mm -hmm. what's your name? And he's like, I'm Legion. And you're like, okay, so that's obviously a critique on the military uh, empire of Rome, right? This is the, this is the unit of Rome that conquered that land to begin with the Legion. That's the feared thing. You don't want to see the legion show up in your town because that means they're coming to get you. And, you know, they're, one of their symbols was the war pig. So it's interesting when he calls those that legion spirit, he sends it into a herd of pigs, which then fly off of the, the cliff and go into the Sea of Chaos, right? The, the Sea of Galilee. So it's just interesting that that's what we're in right now is that we're dealing with a society that says you leave legion alone. Legion is helpful to bind us together. We don't want to have reconciliation. We don't have, we don't want to have harmony uh, between gender and all this stuff. We want to have the chaos and we want to have people that we can scapegoat whenever they are outside of, of, uh, uh, of their mind, according to us. And that's why the community, when, when Jesus heals the man, they're terrified because they've lost their scapegoat. They've mm. lost their binding agent. And right now I think we're in a moment where, um, you know, we have to figure out how to be Christ to the demoniacs around us, including ourselves, if, if we can fall into that and learn how to deprogram from that group think, learn how to deprogram from that imperialistic decadence that had consumed this man's being and made him a, a depository of all the work, wickedness of that community, you know? Mm. I mean, it's an right now is a very interesting moment because because of the way that this up it's all like a weird upside down scapegoat mechanism it's hard to it's really hard to deal with it's very difficult to to address it because 
the, the, what's going on is that those that usually were scapegoated, it's something like the return of the scapegoat. You can almost kind of see it that way. It's like you send the goat away yeah. to Azazel, right? And then it's like it goes out in the desert. And then, you know, at the end of the world, it comes back. And then it's like, then it starts to say, I'm here to judge you, you know, yeah. because you you threw me out. And so there's, it has a weird power, which is able to gather together. There's a, there's a really uh, weird idea in the Northern North, North mythology, which is that this, like this, this God, this God at the end of time, he'll gather the fingernails of everybody, like all the fingernails that were cut off. And he's going to gather them into a chariot and he's going to come and like judge the world or attack the world with his chariot of, of cut, cut off fingernails. Um, and so this idea that at the end, there's like a way to gather up all that is rejected and use it as a vehicle to, to kind of destroy the world. And it seems like that's what is happening. Uh, and it's difficult, especially as Christians, because we have compassion for those that are rejected. We have compassion for those that are marginalized. So it's like we have a natural tendency to want to defend the weak, defend those that are on the outside, defend those that are that, that don't have the cover of normal cover of society. But then, but then, so how do we deal with this? Because all of a sudden there's this strange coming together of all these, these marginal elements and they're becoming tyrannical. And so how do it's, it's a, it's a difficult position to be in, in terms, in terms of Christians. Yeah. uh, Satan is basically using human shields, right? You know, don't touch him or, you know, don't mess with me because he's going to go down. You know, this victim is going to go down with, uh, you know, if you attack me, I'm going to take the victim. I'm going to take this victim. I'm going to take, yeah, you're going to be attacking a victim. You're going to be. It reminds me of, remember that movie, the original, that Batman movie with Michael Keaton and the Joker character. And he's like, you know, you wouldn't hit a man with glasses, would you? And he put the glasses on and he's like, you know, bam, punched him. And it's like, that's the kind of way that Satan works, right? You know, you wouldn't hurt someone who's weak, would you? You know, look yeah. at how weak I look. And that's what he, so he always, that's what the Antichrist is. It always is going into the domain of the scapegoats and saying, hey, this is what Christ tells you to do, to defend them. And you're like, okay, now you're messing with my head. And that, that's the <laughs> way, it, that's how it works. Yeah, exactly. Now <laughs> yeah, you're messing with my head. Because the right <laughs> You know, the right typically gets this wrong because they just react. So they're yeah. like, every time there's a shooting, they're like, oh, you should have been following orders. And it's like, yeah. well, that's the way of the pagan world, right? Yeah. That's how the pagans dealt with that. You know, yeah. if you were to ask a Roman pagan, hey, wasn't that a little bit abusive the way you guys just beat up that guy who was uh, accused of a crime? Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Get out of here. You should yeah. follow orders or else I'm about to lash you too. So you don't, so that's the way the pagan world dealt with things. Here's a hierarchy. You're, if you're not on the certain level of the hierarchy, you shut your mouth or you're going to get killed or hurt or really brutalized. Yeah. And, and today the right is like, I call it like scapegoat classic is the right. And then <laughs> go classic. Yeah. It's like Coca-Cola classic. And then, you know, so you have this, that they're the cl- scapegoat classic. So they're all yeah. about, you know, you should just su- submit. You know, and it's like, okay, well, yeah, there's wisdom in that. Obviously, people should not talk back to police when they have a gun and things like that. You should, you know, and you should do whatever you can to survive, right? Obviously. But if that's what you lead with is just try to submit more, you, you're, you're just, rep- you're not representing the voice of Christ. No, you that's for sure. A metaphysical affinity to Christ. Mm-hmm. You're just functionally, ethically, aesthetically representing the old pagan way of dealing with things, which is shut your mouth, know your role. There's a hierarchy. It's mediated by might makes right. You don't have the might. You don't have a right to speak. Shut your mouth. Yeah. And that's not going to work. That's why the left is always in the driver's seat of culture because mm. the left more effectively imitates the aesthetic and ethic of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. They will, because they, they have kind of weaponized compassion. Um, th- there's an interesting, I keep, coming back to this story, um, the story of Judas in, um, in the gospel, I think it kind of offers us a possible solution in the sense that I always kind of think that the world of antichrist is something like Christianity without Christ. Right. Um, and then because it's Christianity without Christ, it tends to separate into opposites. Like it's right. as if the opposites that Christ united together are kind of appearing to us again. And so we see, we see on the one hand, this kind of weaponized, um, weaponized uh, compassion and then weaponized submission because Christ tells us to be, to submit. So Christ tells us to submit to God, to submit to the will of God. All of these things are, are real. Um, and St. Paul tells us to submit to our authorities. Like all of this is part of the Christian story. Um, 
And then there's also this, this aspect of compassion towards the weak, towards the, towards the, and as you put those together, then you have a coherent, really functioning world because authority needs to take care of those that are weak. And then we need to submit to authority. It's like, okay, I can live in a world like that. That's perfect, right? That, that's a world that will work. But if you split them apart, then you have the, the, the problem that you said, which is that on the one hand, you have someone is like, this is the way it is. Just, just submit, just accept authority. Um, but authority doesn't give it, doesn't give a shit about you. Right. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have this like revolutionary, uh, trope, which is, which is, uh, at least pretends to be fueled by compassion. And so you have these two extremes in, in the story of Judas that I'm alluding to is that there's this moment where the, the sinful woman comes to wash Christ's feet. And then Judas, the antichrist says, we should give this to the poor, right? Give the money to the poor. And so it's like, that's, this is, that's a weird trick. There's the trick right there. And like, if you want to understand the trick that's being played on us, it's the trick right there. It's saying, isn't that what you're saying, Jesus? Like, that's what you say, Jesus, we should help the poor. But there's a, there's a, if you, if you use Christianity as just a more, a morality rather than a way to focus attention together on something above us, and then morality flows from that, then you're, you're in trouble. As soon as you were, if you, as soon as you remove worship as the center of community, right? That's how actually the world works is through all of us attending to something above us. And then everything else flows from there. If you try to just take the, 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 the second aspect, which is the moral aspect, then you, then you're done. Then it's already over because it does, it doesn't work that way. You, compassion itself is not, you, if you love your neighbor, but you don't love God, it doesn't work. You have, those two have to come together. Yeah. And you have to have a role model that won't cause you to have scandal. Right. And that's what Jesus is for. Right. So that's why you can't just do this without Jesus, because you need to anchor your life choices and desires on intentionally imitating a, a role model who will not cause you to have scandal, not cause you to be disappointed, not cause you to get drawn into power, lust, and so forth. Every other guru of history, you know, whether it's Keynes or Marx or Freud or Nietzsche, they're always basically giving you a feeling of just try to keep up, just try to keep up with me, the grand master who knows all things. <laughs> Jesus doesn't do that, right? He's like, just try to keep up with uh, washing feet. You know, he, so he reverses that which is, which is the kind of role model you need to actually uh, do what we're talking about here, which is the renunciation of the, that, that fleshly desire to uh, respond. And there's, there's a lot of physical reality to this, mirror neurons, you know, physical yeah. aggression. It's very hard to stop it once it starts. You know, it's mm -hmm. very hard to stop the feeling you feel. If you, if you and I were to walk by, uh, you know, a fight breaking out, it would cause our heart to race. It would cause yeah. our adrenaline to come. We would get drawn in like magnets. Uh, unfortunately, it's the closer we are to it. Um, and it's very hard to stop it once it happens. It's, it's, mm. it is fleshly in a real sense. It's, it's a part of our body and the way we're made up to, to be wired, to draw into these uh, kind of, uh, you know, violent skirmishes that don't stop. Right. And that's what Jesus is trying to help us overcome. I think that, you know, it's very practical what he's trying to get us to do is very concrete. And I think one thing, you know, when Jesus says over and over again, the meme, he, I, I mean, he says, I am the stone that the builders rejected. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, right? And this is a meme you could think of, of our time, meaning everything that has power, in our society, our Christ haunted society is that which looks like a stone rejected. And that's that act of rejection allows it to become a cornerstone. Look at George Floyd. He was rejected by the builders. The builders are the gatekeepers of the institutions of, of, of law and so forth. And they, they killed him. And in that being rejected, Again, they're debating about how he died, but I'm talking about the story of what it yeah, looks like, right? Yeah. The story of him dying by the builders. His rejection is what allows him to become the cornerstone of a new project, a new way of seeing things where movies and Coca-Cola and everybody's just jumping on to the ideas <laughs> of Foucault, right? That's what happens. Like Foucault has become the uh, the uh, the sacred saint of the Pentagon and their teaching of critical theory and and all these people, but basically he was smuggled in because of the death of George Floyd and others like it. 
Hmm. But it becomes this capstone, this cornerstone that anchors through the act of expulsion. That's that, and that works for everybody. See, yeah. I've told people like the people who don't like Donald Trump, the, the 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 more globalist style, left establishment, corporate class, they hate Trump. And I'm like, the bet the worst thing you could do for your ideology is to put that man in handcuffs. You put that man in handcuffs, you're gonna set back your globalist little project worse than you could possibly do because the visual, right? of the stone being rejected makes it a cornerstone. It, you can call it the Barbara Streisand effect, but that doesn't do it justice. It's this, mm. it's this effect. It's the scapegoat effect. It's this idea that Jesus broke the scapegoat mechanism, and now the reverse is how people get power, intentionally or not, yeah. right? So you ban, if they ban, if they ban, like if they ban you, Jonathan, you'll become more powerful than they can possibly imagine. It's the act of expulsion in this Christ-haunted world, which gives people cornerstone-type energy, yeah. rightly or wrongly. You see what I mean? What, what, but the, this is, I mean, it's interesting because I think that this has been weaponized. Like, and that's why it's difficult to, to get around it right now, where there is a manner in which there is this. Okay, so there's a manner in which right now in the narrative, there's a sense that those that are in power they're the ones that have been rejected and they keep that narrative going. And so the people that actually have power, the narrative about them is that they're constantly in danger. They're constantly being rejected. They're, even though they're actually the ones who hold the reins of power, they are the victims. They are, so there's this strange uh, kind of way of speaking and way of presenting where they're able to maintain on the one hand uh, to be the ones in power who are actually rejecting and scapegoating other people, but have a story about themselves being constantly scapegoated while being in power and therefore being able to maintain their power that way. And so like Dionysus, right? I mean, maybe, maybe that's what it is. I'm not, it's like, I'm not totally sure I completely get it. Like, and so, so I noticed that like, when you say that people getting banned are, have more power, it's like, that's not really happening. The people that are getting banned are not, are, are losing power. Right now, at least, like the all the people term, that have been banned from social media have complete, a lot of them have vanished. Like, I, whether I agree with them or not, whether I think that, like, they think that uh, Stéphane Molineux's opinions are reprehensible, he's gone. And he doesn't have a voice anymore. And so right. it's like, whether I think that uh, even Alex Jones, like, he, he's holding on a little bit, but whether I think that he has, uh, that I agree with him or not, he's pretty much, he's being really tossed from the, from the, 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 the story. So I don't right. totally, I don't know. I struggle to see like what exactly is happening and like what, what, what's going to happen. But I feel like they've really been able to weaponize the, the scapegoat mechanism to keep it on their side all the time. Right. And that's why, you know, that January 6th thing, right. They said that was an insurrection. It was a revolution. There was like no guns found where maybe one person had a gun or something, but they weren't even wielding it. Um, uh, so one guy brought, uh, uh, I guess, a, a handful of plastic uh, ties, you know, and, and and but they turned that into this is a 9-11 like event. And, you know, and, and so what happened, you know, um, with that is, you know, that and, and of course, the right was imitating the left in their mobs that they saw over the summer. So they were mimetically undifferentiated with from their leftist opponents. But but the, the TV, the TV party used that as an opportunity to remind people of the sacredness of their temple. Nancy Pelosi said, this is a sacred temple. Well, a temple is sacred in the pagan world because you sacrifice, you choose who lives and who dies. You choose who's being sacrificed. You choose how it's sacrifice is going to happen. That's exactly what DC has done. That's, that's exactly what the Capitol building has done. The Capitol building plots insurrection chaos all over the globe. Mm -hmm. They did it in, they did it in, Bing, uh, uh, in Libya. In Tripoli, they did it in uh, in Damascus. Yeah, they're Ukraine always scheming to create insurrection yeah. chaos there. That's why they're sacred. They have the power. They determine which capitals are destroyed. You don't ever step in that sacred temple. You have profaned it, right? You don't you don't bring a mob chaos to their doorstep. That's what they do around the world, yeah. and that's why we're dealing with these things. See, I take. I think a lot of the ways that we can solve these, this problem is to literally start trying to practice nonviolence as a church. We should be fighting against these wicked wars. We should be fighting against these wicked laws that pulverize people's liberties, that humiliate people's families. And if we would do that, I mean, I'm not saying it's a political answer only, but I do believe that that's one way to start easing the tension and start providing a witness 
mm-hmm. um, in the in the madness. So so for example, like we we're always because Christians typically react because that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be the forward vision thinkers, but we always react. So we're always like, okay, well, um, yeah, uh, the, we have a lot of broken families. People don't stay married and so forth. But have you not seen? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about America now. You know how many years we've been at war, and what war does to families. What mm-hmm. does war do to you know people who have PTSD? What does it do to tear families apart if someone dies or is maimed or burned? What happens generationally when you're always at war? I mean, I can think of people all around me who have grandparents that were tortured in World, you know, World War II and so forth like that. And and that and that violence, it spirals generationally into uh next generation because of, mm-hmm. of, of abuse or whatever happens, things like that. So so much of what we are experiencing could be stopped if the church would be more uh, uh, forward in stopping sacrificial violence from happening on their watch. Instead of always saying, all right, send our sons off to war. Wait a second. You know, there's a reason why the early church had a timeout period of what? What was it, two years? If you were a military person who converted to the church, you couldn't be baptized. You had to spend two years getting uh, catechized Mm -hmm. because they realized that, you know, going to war was really a pagan thing. I and mean, I'm not saying there's never a place for war here. I'm just saying that the way yeah. it's done is often pagan, right? And yeah, that's, and the, and that's the, an example of how we've been going along with wickedness. And then we're surprised when we're catechizing generations in denialism. Well, how did this happen? How mm. did this happen? Yeah. You've been just tearing families apart. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, in the, in the Orthodox uh, tradition, even I think still today, or maybe, maybe not today, but at least until the late middle ages, there was a sense where soldiers, it was accepted that soldiers go to war, but the, whatever they did during their, there wasn't like, it was this idea of holy war where the killing you did in war, you had to go to confession for, you couldn't, wasn't, you wouldn't like get some kind of merit for the killing that you did in terms of the church. You might get uh, social merit. You might get like, let's say, secular glory in terms of being recognized, but you wouldn't, get, you would still have to confess that uh, in church. Um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I don't know, I, like in terms of, uh, I see it more, I, I, I tend to see it more from the idea of the saint in the sense that I tend to see it more in terms of the personal, let's say, and that's kind of where one of the places where I agree with, with Jordan Peterson, for example, which is that I, I really think that the world is built through, through saints and that, that saints hold up reality. And so the best thing you can do is to create a loving community within your family, within those around you, that you learn to, to love God and to love your neighbor, and that will reverberate. Um, but I think that in terms of a, of a social effect, at least like a direct social effect in terms of politics and stuff, I think it's too late. I'm sorry. I, I wish I, I wish I could be more positive, but I think that I think that uh, like Christians in terms of Christian societies don't exist anymore. Like we don't have Christian nations. That, that, I have a little the, bit of a different spin on it. I mean, I'm yeah. not totally sold on not believing what you're saying. I'm, I kind of believe that way too. But there's another side of me that thinks that perhaps uh, you know we're actually more Christian than ever. And that mm. if we can get into the little Nas and that WandaVision, I, I I haven't seen either, but I just read your description of it. That's all I know about them. But uh, um, I, I feel like the more, you know, you were talking about how it seems like it's more and more cleverly disguised in Christian garb, right? That to me sounds like a defeated enemy, right? If Satan has to continually up his game and no, I agree. I, I agree with this, you. And I think I think right? in the end, light will win. In the end, I totally agree with you. And I think even in the article, I say, I I, I even say that. I say so Satanism is ultimately restating Christianity despite itself, you know, and that's actually what's going on. But in the meantime, like there is a meantime, like there was a moment, there was a moment where Christ was being dragged in the city, like there was a moment where. Christ was on the cross. And so there is a, there is a moment right now that Christianity is definitely dying at, uh, you know, and that it's not, it's no longer a, an explicit social force. And I think that, like you said, implicitly, it's still filling up the world. But as I talk is, about this, 
Sorry? As it is expelled, it will become more powerful. See, it's in the act of expulsion that you become the cornerstone. So as people see Christians being more overtly persecuted, it will get more and more people interested in it. And that's what happens. That's the trap that Jesus set for Satan. And, and Jesus is winning. I mean, that's the thing is like, it looks ugly. I mean, obviously, yeah. the history is rife with a lot of horrible terrible uh, abuse of human beings and terrible pain and suffering. And we don't, we're not immune to that not happening, you know, and, and so we're starting to see the reality of history come back to our doorstep. It doesn't mean that we're losing though. It just means that things are getting real and Satan's losing and he's going to start striking out more and more uh, viciously and cleverly, cleverly. But the problem is he's losing his game because he has to keep imitating. It's like, if you have a competitor, and in the old days, he he didn't have to dress up his stuff. You know, he was just like off with their heads or, you know, hey, take that guy and do a, um, you know, the uh, the way the Vikings would split their ribs open, you know, the cross eagle. Yeah. Go ahead and do that. You know, Satan was having a great time back then. That was a nice time for his brand. You know, he, he could just do whatever he wanted. He didn't have to sophisticate. He didn't have to hide things in a sophisticated way. Yeah. But now his, he's getting his tail beat so badly by Jesus through 2000 years that he's having to guise it up more. I mean, look at football. We have simulated warfare now. We don't have gladiator games. Yeah. And they put cushions in the hats because they don't want to get people concussions. Yeah. They Jesus care about yeah, exactly. when you look at the big scale of things, you know? No, I agree. I totally agree with you. I definitely agree that I agree that that in the in Christianity's death there is a surprise that is getting prepared. And it's the same surprise that Christ gave the world 2000 years ago, but on a cosmic scale. Um, but I, but I, I, I was mostly re referring to the idea that politically right now, that, you know, that Christians should have some kind of political effect on war and all of this stuff. Like, I'm not sure that that I'm not, I, I'm not sure that that can really happen, but I, maybe, I maybe so. I'm right. I, here's what I think. Think about this. Yeah. I mean, if you want to empathize with the left, you know, I listen to the left, and they say, you guys, every time there's a police shooting, all you say is you should have obeyed faster. And I say, you know, there's a truth to that. You know, it doesn't mean that they're always right, but there's a truth to that sentiment. That is a prophetic critique. Mm -hmm. And so if we start to listen to that critique, that doesn't mean we defund the police or whatever. But if you start to listen to that truth and see where you can harmonize with it, then you can actually get here. The, here's the deal. It's not about, Oh, if we do something different, we'll win over the left. They'll, they'll love us. They may, you know, anybody can return to Christ. What we're interested in is everybody in between who's on the fence, who they don't know what to do. And they're just kind of like, okay, so if I'm concerned about injustices, who's the game in town for that? And they're like, it's the, these guys over here, Antifa, BLM. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Okay. So that's the department I go to if I'm interested in justice stuff. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. That why does it have to be the only game in town? Mm. You know, I think, you know, I, on my radio show, I, I practice what I call gospel technology, which is using technology, using a media technology to provide a voice for victims of sacrifice. And so it's not about, oh, I mean, you could say it is, oh, you're trying to like out scratch the, the uh, concern for victims that the left provides in culture. Maybe that's that. But at the end of the day, it's good because it's good in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it doesn't really matter what effect it has. It means when you see the left outraged at us for not doing enough for victims, just use it as an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to guide us to say, well, how can we be more intentional in doing exactly what Jesus said? We will be judged on the, the wheat, the, the sheep and the goats. Mm -hmm. Where were you? When you when they were hungry, where were you when they were in prison? So on my show, just an example, we, we we can't do this now because of Corona. They've locked down the prisons, but we used to have prisoners call in live from prison, and they were they would have lifetime sentences, sometimes life sentences for nonviolent drug offenses, first mm. offense, conspiracy yeah. charge. They're in prison for life. One guy was fixing trucks, moving marijuana. His name is Craig Cecil. And we had him call in live from prison and reunite with his uh, his daughter live on air to talk about what life was like before prison, what life is like in prison, and why he wants to come home. Now he has clemency for that was the last that was the, on the last day of President Trump. He got clemency, so mm. now he's home. But the point in what I'm saying is that has a power in and of itself because gospel the gospel texts are a piece of media where people write 
an account of a wrongfully persecuted scapegoat. Mm -hmm. And, and then you just tell the truth. See, that's the power. You just tell the truth. He was innocent. He did not deserve the treatment yeah. that he got. And that has this supernatural power that we don't fully understand. And that's what I think Christians should be doing right now. When they say, oh, burn the city down, we say, no, where are the victims here? How can we stand in solidarity with the victims? And the victims are not just the poor. They're also the rich. The victims are not just one race group. It's, it's it, Victims come in all shapes and sizes. And when we when we focus on that, we can get people who are raging about injustice and they're going to Satan to get their, their justice reform fix. And we can turn them back and say, Hey, there's a Christ way to do this too. It may, it may not fill your envy meter up. It may not, you know, get your rage satisfied, mm -hmm. but it'll actually give you something better. You know, it'll yeah. give you reconciliation. It will give you love because when you love what Jesus stood in solidarity with or not solidarity, well, I guess, he, he stood and protected the woman accused of adultery. Yeah. Right. He didn't let her get killed. Now the right wants to have the woman get stoned for adultery. The left yeah. wants to stone Jesus for telling her to go and sin no more. But yeah, exactly. Jesus <laughs> makes everybody mad. If you really pay attention to what he's saying, it's like, it's hard. It's hard to get the whole picture because we like one aspect of him and other, another aspect always makes us a little uneasy, you know? So what's this Wanda vision and Lil Nas thing about? Just give us a quick summary for those, because, you know, it's a big thing and they're talking about in the culture. You you described it well. You don't have to describe all the all the uh, dance moves of Lil Nas. But yeah, no, I mostly wanted to, first of all, try to help people understand what is the satanic uh, imagery and why why it's attracting attention. Like, why is it that he could make a video like that? First of all, obviously put it out one week before Easter you know, a nicely, nicely uh, set up propaganda machine, which always every before every Easter or Christmas, we'll always get a little bit of media to uh, to kind of show how trying to, to mock or to show how Christianity is stupid. <laughs> um, but I mostly wanted to show how there's a coherence in the symbolism that's used. And it's like a satanic coherence. And it's a it's a coherence of of a revolutionary structure and a structure which is based on self self love and pride. And how this self-love and pride plays itself out in this in this revolutionary trope, which you see in the uh, in the video, which ends with him uh, breaking the neck of the devil and then putting the crown, the devil's crown, on his own head. And so I tried to show how this revolutionary pattern is there. You know, from you know, in the Enlightenment, you have uh, Napoleon putting the crown on his own head and declaring himself emperor. You see that also in history, just the idea of of self-declaring yourself an authority it's the sin in the garden, right? It's the taking the fruit for yourself. It's the devil trying to take the place of God. All of this revolutionary pattern is kind of boiled down into this, in this strange video about, you know, about a rapper who, who is seduced by himself and then falls into like a self victimhood, self abasement. And then finally this kind of self uh, revolution where he, he kills the devil himself and puts the crown on his head. Um, so it's a form of solipsism and a form of sterility all of this is like part of the, the imagery. And, uh, and in WandaVision, I tried to show WandaVision has a similar pattern where you have this character, this witch who creates this solipsistic world where she creates like a matrix. And, and then she, she has her, she kind of preserves her husband in this, this fake husband alive. And she has these fake children in this matrix. And then she try and she tortures everybody in order to preserve this kind of fantasy world like that she has. Show. Yeah, with well, something like that, except that except that people are she's the one who's torturing. It's as if Truman was creating an ideal world for himself and willing to torture everybody else in order to 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 preserve that. Mm. So she's kind of presented as a bad as immoral, but nonetheless, like you're supposed to have sympathy for her way more than you are for all the people she's torturing in order to in order to make that happen. Um, and so I wanted to really show how the the satanic pattern, like people who say they worship the devil, most of them don't believe in the devil, right? If you, if you talk to LeVay type Satanists, they, they'll tell you, I don't believe in the devil. They're, they really want to embody this kind of Promethean figure. For of, them it's like, he's like the flying spaghetti monster, right? Yeah, he's well, the, for them, it's mostly that he's a figure of, of secularism. Like the devil is, a, is a, actually a, a figure of secularism, which is this this notion of equality in the sense of declaring yourself equal to that, which is above you taking power from that, which is above you. Um, 
and uh, and ultimately saying you know saying that God doesn't exist and cutting the head off the head of the king are similar gestures. It's like I'm removing I I'm the authority of myself. Like it's a self a self authority, and it's it's like because that's what actually American culture is based on that idea. Like it's based on the idea of right. Yeah. yeah, the idea of the ind- supreme individual, the idea of the individual that that is uh, the author of reality, basically. But now it's brought to a caricature, and the caricature is is part of the social narrative, which is that the idea, for example, in uh, like the weird gender stuff, where I am going to change the entire world based on my proclivity, based on my desire. So I have a sense that I am this like unknown gender. And now I want all of reality to accept that, not only accept it, but change all their laws, all their rules. Everything has to apply to my particular idiosyncratic will. And so I'm trying to show how the satanic trope, even though obviously little Nas X is doing this to provoke, you know, he's using all the tropes he can to just get attention. But the very fact that to get attention, you can do something like that tells us about where we are in culture, right? If he had, if you had put a video like that out 200 years ago, they would just put him in jail or something. Like they would have just, or they would have ignored him. Like the, these these satanic bands have been around forever, and no one cares. Like there are way worse things in culture. Like uh, you know, I don't Cannibal Corpse or War or all these horrible bands. No one pays attention to them. But the fact that we're paying attention to this and it's getting hundreds of millions of views, they're talking about it in the media, and they're talking about all the reaction to it in the media means that it's having. It has a cultural place to play in the, the narrative and it's exemplifying something about where we are uh, in the story and what our values are. So that's basically the, the, the point of the article. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think that's going to satisfy. I think this is a sign that this is going to be a quick thing and, there, and we're going to be on to something else because, because again, like look at the top box office performing movies, right? Spider-Man and Avengers and Batman and everything. If you look at all those stories, they're all Christian still, even though they're they're adding, you know, pagan violence symbols and stuff in there. Yeah. All of it, you know, like the end of the Avengers, and this is a spoiler for those of you who haven't seen it. Uh, the end of the Avengers is the character has to sacrifice his himself life yeah. to say so. So it show, the, the story is very Christian. Look, yeah. they're, they're fighting a war. That's not going to solve it. Beating them with force is not going to solve it. I've heard that before. Yeah. That's do not resist evil with violence. That's take up your cross. That's go, you know, so it's the same stuff. War's not going to solve this. Self sacrifice magically solves the whole thing. Christian. Mm. Yeah. And so you get that Batman, everything. They're all doing stuff like that. I mean, I always joke about the Jurassic Park world, the last movie they made, the end of the movie, they had a conundrum. Should we let these flesh eating dinosaurs just run loose into North America and the suburbs? Or should we euthanize them? <laughs> and they decided, no, God, we can never euthanize these poor little creatures. It's better for humanity to take this one, take this one, you know, <laughs> on the neck here, because we got to let these things run around and, and hang out in our backyards rather than to kill them. So yeah, there is, well, there's a competition. Like there's definitely competition in the, in narrative, and it's 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 playing out. There's a lot of ideology which is seeping into into storytelling, and so we're seeing we're seeing this. Um, and and in one division, really do have this this very strange. It's a very strange story, especially because it's like a it's a witch that is that is use, cre- creating a media world because she lives in these sitcoms and she's created a media world in order to, con- to mind control society. And and she's doing it to preserve her little idiosyncratic desires. And you think. But they really yeah. make a story like that? That's a very yeah. disturbing story. Yeah. Um, well, that, so, there's a so lot of that it, going on around us today. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And, but th- do you really think that that's going to be uh, a turn towards uh, a dark uh, pattern of this kind of story catching on for decades? Or do you think it's going to burn out fast? Because, I, again, I just don't think that's satisfying. People want the Christ figure. They want the dying to self. That's why Avengers is at the box office what it, you know, what it, what it performs, you know, that's the kind of movies that people want because their hearts are still haunted yeah. by the cross. And so they're wrestling with the questions that Jesus puts into their hearts, not the questions of which is. No, I, I agree, but that's why, that's why, that's what force is for. <laughs> like force is to impose patterns that are, that are false and to make them hold for longer than they should, you know? And so it's like the communist story was a false story. But they could they they were still able to enforce it for a, a very painful while. 
you know, on the people. And I think that we're, we're seeing there are weird tyrannical moves in, in culture where it seems like certain, certain uh, patterns are going to be enforced on us and going to be imposed on us. And so if market forces don't, don't uh, let's say, apply to, the, to these types of stories, they're still going to continue to come out. Just like propaganda doesn't care if you like it or not. It just needs to be pumped out at you nonstop in order to try to change the natural, like the natural pattern of being and to try to apply it to your will. And so I think that those stories are not going to go away soon uh, just because right now the powers that be are behind those stories. And so they're going to continue. It's going to be a painful while. I agree that in the end it can't hold because it's not just like communism can't hold. It collapses because it, it's not a natural pattern. But but it can take a while and it can be painful before it happens. Do you think that do you think that America and Canada are capable in this time period to do um, uh, authoritarian violent policies like to the level of Nazism and Stalinism? Yes, I think it's going to it can take a, it, it can take a little while, but it doesn't take that long. It doesn't take that long before people accept it. It's like right now in Canada, they've set up, uh, they've set up um, these these uh, isolation places for people who travel. And so, if you come back from from somewhere, they will uh, put you in uh, a hotel that nobody knows where they are. They like they they just take you there, and you're forced Sounds to stay like the there Shining, for several. Huh? Sorry. Sounds like The Shining in the movie. And you're forced to stay there for several days. And so people say, well, it's not a big deal. You know, it's just it's just for health measures. It's just for this. But once the system of control is set up, you know, it's there. Government doesn't like to give up systems of control once they've set them up. And so once that's set up, it can be used for all kinds of reasons. And also in the fact that COVID is is actually coming down politically you know, that it, it's actually not coming down just in terms of medical. It's having, it's, it's actually seems to be happening politically and people are taking political sides with COVID. Then it means that the medical, the idea of medically quarantining someone by force will end up being a political gesture and not just a medical gesture. Interesting. What, 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 what do you think is the significance of the, uh, critical theory, cancel culture, and the racial uh, unrest coinciding with the COVID stuff. It's been weird, right? It's like a twofer. You got this yeah, double. The, have you looked into the symbolic meaning of these things coming together at the same time? Or Yeah, no, for sure. I've been thinking about that quite a bit. I did. I made a few videos on uh, George Floyd and how George and how the COVID treatment was acting like a kind of fasting you know, especially last year, you had this lockdown, which was uh, strangely during Lent as well. So you had this weird lockdown, which was like a fasting where people were taken, sports was taken away from people. All the mechanisms of venting were kind of taken away, going out, hanging out with your friends. So everybody was locked down. And then this killing happened. And the killing was really, was really, like you said, it, it was, it was really a, uh, it was really a ritual thing. It was, it, it, played out religiously because especially in terms of race, what happened is that the white people were supposed to both identify with the victim and identify with the killer, right? It's because you couldn't just identify with the victim because you're, you're part of the problem. And so you need to identify with the killer and with the victim. And it's like, that leads to ecstatic religious experience. And that's what happened. People like exploded out into the street and then then the only reason why we were allowed to commune together was to celebrate this event. And so, it, and so the state sanctioned this religious celebration and removed all its strictures in order to permit this one reason why we are allowed to come together. So, it, so what it was telling us was the only reason we have to come together is to fight racism. The only reason we have to commune is to participate in this pattern of 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 uh, of sacrifice and like self-flagellation and this weird event where we we both like you said we both uh, see ourselves as those that killed George Floyd and made him a scapegoat and then celebrate him as a new a new god basically a new saint and the imagery was in some of the imagery was insane like showing him with wings and halos and and even icons of George Floyd and people you know there were images of him where people would come and 
and would kneel in front of the images and like put all these, 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 these flowers and stuff. And so it really was a religious event that happened. So how, how does it fit? So how does it fit so nicely though, into perpetuity though, you know, this idea that we're, we're living in this world where we're going to have a new normal where we're having everything canceled. Like, it's just weird how like Dr. Seuss is being canceled and curious George and all this stuff. Plus the pandemic is continuing to like become a, a new normal as, as yeah. part of this. Like what is the connection between we're scared of, we're scared of a disease and we're also scared of differentiation, right? It's strange, well, right? Well, it has to do, I think it has to do with the idea that you want people, you want to break down totalitarian governments. One of the things they need to do is to break down any form of community besides their own power. And yeah. so, totalitarian governments have to attack Christians. It's like they have to attack religions. They have to attack groups, clubs, anything that is in competition with the total power that the, the totalitarian system installs. A normal society is fractal, right? A normal society has groups at all levels. So your family and your club and your society of this and society of that don't compete with the higher authority. They actually kind of fit together into this right. fractal dance that goes up. Whereas the modern totalitarian system is, is a total system. So there's only one identity and it's the system and every other identity has to be leveled. And so breaking down communion in, in communities, putting on the face mask, making you into a number, right? Even removing your own identity facing the other, making you just into this like a number on, you can imagine it like the suburbs, right? So it's like all these, all these, these undifferentiated dots on a, on a plane and then the totalitarian system coming and claiming all of it and just saying, the only thing that unites us is, is this, this is the only thing. And it's like, and so, and then it, and then it has a weird, it has a whole weird aesthetic of the only value we have is inclusion. The only value we have is not, is not, uh, is not excluding anybody. And so that becomes the only value for a society. It doesn't America. work. It's, it's not going to work. It's a, it's, a, it's a misunderstanding of reality. It's a misunderstanding of how, of how identity actually functions in a fractal manner. But they're going to try to do it anyways. They're, they're, they're going to try to do it, impose it nonetheless. And see, the fact that they're obsessed with the only value is inclusion is, gives evidence to me for Gerard's thesis about Christianity, right? Because it's like he says that Jesus breaks the scapegoat mechanism. And the foundational moment for scapegoating is the ability to have differentiation. Now, differentiation in and of itself does, is not violent or evil. It can be abusive. It can be violent, but it's not inherently in and of itself that way. But, but for some reason, the place where we're at right now in our Christ-haunted society is that this new religion, it, 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 it gets stuck on the differentiation part. And it says differentiation itself is violent. So, if, yeah. you know, if it's 70%, 80% of engineering students are, are men graduates, we have to get that reversed to 70% woman graduates or engineers, you know, engineering yeah, and graduates. And it's like, that's equity. That's the idea of vengeance against differentiation. And so that's what they're using to eliminate all differences is this, if you have differentiation, if there's anything distinct about that gender outcome versus that, or, or, you know, if, if, if a person of color is uh, killed by police, you know, notice that Ashley Babbitt, she was shot you know, for no reason, there was no reason to kill Ashley Babbitt at the Capitol six thing, January six thing, but they won't touch it because it doesn't fit their narrative for totalitarian power. You know, that's a, that's a counter story that doesn't, that doesn't have a sacred death component to their agenda. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. all, all life is sacred and no, no one is to determine, you know, which one's more efficacious of a, of a death or whatever. It's ridiculous, but that's the way this religion works. Right. But that's that that to me is a sign of exactly what Jesus predicted where he said that mother will be against daughter and father will get, be against son and so forth meaning that's what happens to societies when they are when they get the gospel revelation but they don't want to repent right mm -hmm. that's what happens it dissolves all the boundaries of hierarchy and togetherness that were built on older institutions of sacrifice and when you dissolve them you you go back to the primordial undifferentiation uh, of the chaos that all these creation myths around the world talk about this primordial chaos that's resolved by some kind of cartoonish 
violence amongst the gods, what we realize that is is actually not the, the beginning of, of the world, but rather the beginning of the social order again, a, a mm-hmm. restart, right? And so that's what, so we're headed towards that primordial chaotic moment because we don't want to repent, but we, yeah. I don't believe that it's some kind of thing set in stone. I think at any moment we could repent. We could have uh, a, a renaissance. We could have revival. Yeah. Uh, I think there will be, I think there'll be, I always, I think the image of the ark is probably a, the best image. I think that, in the darkness and in the chaos that is setting up there, there, there will be people who will notice what's going on and then will repent and will make a move, let's say, but at least for now, it it will be like a seed that's being planted for, for the next, whatever. Like, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but it, it seems like that's what's going to happen. And in terms of the idea of undifferentiation, one of the weirdness about the moment is that, is that, undifferentiation doesn't exist, right? It, like pure chaos doesn't exist. It's actually underneath existence. It, it, it doesn't exist in itself. And in the desire for, to return to chaos, right? The desire to have uh, mat- just pure materiality or the desire to have, let's say, pure equality, all of these types of gestures towards undifferentiation, they, what they, they end up doing is actually create upside down hierarchies because undifferentiation doesn't exist. And so in order to attain undifferentiation, the move that's made is to, to put the upside down above. Right. At first saying we're going we're gonna to create this, this equality, but it, doesn't, it ends up doing like a, creating a satanic hierarchy, an, an upside down hierarchy. Because you want to get so, rid of meritocracy and all this other stuff, which just- So you end up putting, let's say, the, the, all, you take, you take the, the, the most marginalized character and then you make them into the top of the hierarchy just, but you want them to stay marginalized. It's like a weird thing. It's like you don't really make them king in the way you don't really make them king or you don't really make them in. It's, it's, it's hard to totally understand that's why what's going they on. Hate, that's why they hate like black conservatives and black libertarians because they're part of the marginalized community of African-Americans, but they don't, they don't, don't fit. Lie. Right. They don't they don't come together in the way oh. that they want that image to come together into a to like a new a new image or a new a new idol. To, they see to, them as like tricksters, don't they? You know, like shapeshifters. Right. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, Which you is have, fascinating. Like, yeah. You have it's, certain uh, sacred identity markers, but yet you speak a tongue that does not conform to the ideas of Karl Marx or John Maynard Keynes or. Yeah. Uh, Michel Foucault, Herbert Marcuse. These are the same. And isn't it funny, by the way, the, 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 the white supremacy of their whole thing, they got a bunch of dead old white European guys. And that's the only game in town. If you care about racial justice, you got to be into Herbert Marcuse or Foucault, or maybe a little bit of Karl Marx. If you're, if you're a moderate Democrat, you can embrace Keynes, but you have to have all these dead old white European guys ideas. If you want to be authentically black, I mean, how racist is that? Isn't it? Isn't it amazing? (laughs) No, but it, it, it's definitely it's definitely a weaponizing of of uh, of identity and race that we're seeing now, and it's uh, yeah. So it it's hard to it's hard to. I mean, I think that at least as per, as people, you just have to continue to exemplify the 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 love of Christ. I always tell people that you you just need to be honest about your encounter with someone, you know. And so we've like for example, like we've demonized the surprise of the strange which is actually something which is completely natural. So you, if you try to demonize that, then you create this weird thing. It's like, yeah, meet someone from another culture and be surprised at how weird they are compared to you, but don't take that as a, as a, as a means to, to demonize them, but just take it as this strange surprise and like this encounter where you discover and you, 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 you exchange and then slowly the differences start to tame each other and yeah. you start to, to see the person for something more than just, a stereotype, but that reaction to the strange is a totally natural reaction. It's like I lived in Africa for seven years, and it's like there are some things that I saw there that were just to me completely unfathomable. And it was just like, okay, hmm, well let's talk. Let's 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 talk about this. Like let's let's say, let's meet each other as people, and then have a, a slow discovery of each other, so that we yeah. that we learn to love each other in a real way. Well, Jonathan, I really have enjoyed this discussion and I want to give you last comments or thoughts if there's anything you'd like to let people know about. And uh, I'll leave you with the final question of 
So what do you, I mean, you've, you've kind of sketched a little bit of an idea about what we should do. Do you, are you a fan of like the Benedict option or, you know, what, what's your prescription for, you know, how Christians or people who are concerned about this time should be thinking and acting? Well, I, I think that in terms of, I think Christians need to rediscover, let's say Christianity. I think that we need to rediscover just how permeating it is in terms of a story one of the problems that we've had in, in terms of Christianity is that we basically accepted a materialist point of view, and then we've overlaid this Christian story on top of it. And so there's almost like a schizophrenic yeah. vision of, of Christianity. I think we need to replunge into, okay, let's say, the worldview of Christianity, see it as a, as, a, as a theory about reality itself and how reality actually works, and, and start to try to embody that in practice in terms of our own uh, spiritual life, in terms of our, our community. And I think that that's really the only, the only option. And then what that will lead to is beauty and uh, powerful stories. Because the stories, you, you said it, the stories that are being told right now are horrible. And they're, they're not true. And so if we can, if we can relive and re-embody the power of the story that Christ offers us, then we can then present that to the world. Like we can live it and then show it and embody it in beauty in terms of even in terms of art, in terms of community uh, that will be like shining beacons. And so I think that that's the, that's the best way to, to go about this. Well, very beautifully said. I appreciate your time, Jonathan. Thanks for coming. Now, thanks for having me. It was, it was a lot of fun. 